Well, we are continuing our summer study looking at the Sermon on the Mount together. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 17. That's where we're going to pick up from last week. Uh, we're, we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, which is his longest teaching anywhere in Scripture, he tells us what it means to be a part of his kingdom. And one of the things we're going to see over and over again is that Christ's kingdom is kind of an upside down kingdom. It is so different than the kingdom of this world. And the values that Jesus teaches us are very different. They're, they're, they're almost a, a complete contrast to the values that we find in our world today. But I think in a world that is so turned upside down, what better time to learn to live in Christ's upside down kingdom, to follow him with uh, deep devotion and faithfulness in these difficult days. So let's look at his words together, picking up where we left off last week, Matthew chapter five, starting at verse 17. Jesus says this, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of our Lord. Well, let's talk about two things today. First is Jesus's place in history. Who was he and who is he in light of all of human history? Well, there is a group that I think has too low a view of Jesus. Uh, this we talked about a few weeks ago, so I don't want to belabor this point, but this would be very much the materialist view. Those who do not believe in the supernatural, who do not believe in a God. They believe in just materialism. And so they look at Jesus historically and they say, he was a great man, a good teacher, but clearly he was not divine because there is no such thing as divine. Or other groups see him as a prophet or some sort of spiritual leader, but do not see him as equal to the Father. And they lower Jesus. Now, most of these people recognize the historic impact of Jesus and the Christian movement. So it's hard not to recognize just how important Jesus Christ is in world history. The Christian movement um, grew in, in such an amazing way and has influenced all of the Western world and now to the edges of the earth. He's, he's been incredibly impactful. So many people say, well, Jesus was a great teacher. He was a great man. Yes, Lewis has a very popular argument that is often entitled the liar, lunatic, or lord argument. And he, and he basically says this, Jesus himself claimed divinity. He claimed to be equal with God. And so if he did this, then it's hard to say that he was just a good man. Because if he claimed divinity and he knew he wasn't really divine, then he's a liar. He's a manipulator. He's a schemer. Well, that would not make him a good man. Or if he claimed divinity and he really believed that he was divine, but he wasn't, that would make him crazy. It would make him a lunatic. And so Lewis basically brings up the point that Jesus could not have been just an ordinary good man, a good teacher. If he claimed to be one with God, he was either lying, he was either crazy, or he is who he claimed to be. But there, there's a second way that we err in, in thinking about Jesus in the, in the course of human history. And it's one way, is, and it, this sounds kind of wrong, but it's too high a view of Jesus, which I know that sounds like a contradiction because as Christians, we believe that Jesus Christ is fully divine. He was truly man and truly God. So it's hard to think of like how you could have too high a view of Jesus. And maybe that's not quite the right wording, but there is a group and there has been groups that have elevated Jesus almost out of his historic context, even out of the pages of scripture themselves, and to focus solely on Jesus without understanding all of his historic context. Let me, let me explain this. It is a view that basically says all that matters is Jesus. And these groups, some of the time, will reject all that comes before the Old Testament 
and even what comes after Paul's writings and other New Testament writings. And it elevates Jesus above all else and even at the cost of all other divine revelation. This is a very early problem that came against Christianity. There was an early heresy rejected by the church called Marcionism. It was taught by a man named Marcion. And this is very early on. Marcion was born around the year AD 85 and he died around AD 160. So this is very, very early on, really within the first couple of generations of Christians. And, and Marcion believed that Jesus was the savior of the world. And so we had a very high view of Jesus. But then he also began to reject all that came before Jesus. In fact, Marcion really pitted Jesus, the divine savior of the world, against the Old Testament God, who was you know, too judgmental for his liking. And he really stripped Jesus of his historic context. And Marcionism is a problem for several reasons. It's not really a problem because it elevates Jesus to such a high level. It's a problem because it, it, it strips away the context. So one, one problem is it removes Jesus's Jewishness. Jesus is the son of God. And he was also a first century Jewish rabbi. Another problem that Marcionism has is it ignores Jesus' own words. Jesus repeatedly identifies with the God of the Old Testament. He claims that the, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob is his father. Jesus historically connects his relationship to his father with the God of the Hebrew people. And, and it ignores Jesus' actual words here. Jesus says, I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets is just a way of saying the Old Testament or the Old Covenant. He said, not an iota, the smallest letter in the Greek language, not a stroke of the pen will be eradicated from the law until it is all accomplished and fulfilled. Now, there are some prominent evangelicals that are pushing a form of Marcionism even this day. They often refer to themselves as like red letter Christians. And this is based on, you know, in most English translations, the words of Jesus are marked in red to set them apart. And, and these groups of Christians often say all that matters are the words of Jesus. All that matters are the gospels. Now, I believe the gospels are the center of all that we believe and that Jesus is central. But... Jesus does not stand in complete isolation apart from the history of the Hebrew people, apart from God's prior revelation and from the work of the Holy Spirit, God's continual revelation. So what is the proper view of Jesus in history? And that's what we find in this text. Jesus is the one who comes to fulfill the covenant, the old covenant. He is the central person in all of human history, but he is not the only person in all of human history. He is the central revelation of God, but he is not the only revelation of God. Think about salvation history. We can kind of look as an overview of what the history of salvation is all about. It begins with creation. God creates everything and everything is good. And immediately after creation, we see the fall, the fall of humanity where sin and brokenness and death enter into the human experience. But then we don't go from the fall, skipping right to the redemption through Jesus Christ. We have the whole series of God's revelation to his called people, the children of Abraham, the Hebrew people. And for, for generations and generations, for thousands of years, God is working through his people. And then we come to the Christ, the Messiah, Christ's incarnation, his atonement, his crucifixion and resurrection, his ascension. We see the redemptive work of Christ. But even that is not the end of the story. We see now the age of the church, the sending of the Holy Spirit, the work of followers of Jesus Christ, the era of God's kingdom through his church. And then finally will come the return of Christ, the second coming, the judgment of and finally, the end of history, the recreation, eternity. Jesus is the central character in the entire story, but he doesn't stand in isolation. And if we, under, if we don't understand all that led up to the coming of the Messiah, then we really won't understand the Messiah. Jesus is 
the central person in all of Scripture, and he fulfills all that comes before. But he doesn't eradicate the Old Testament. The Old Testament all leads to him, which is why it is so essential to understand him. So this is Christ's position in history. He is the central figure of history, but he does not stand in isolation. In fact, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the divine trinity, are the three central persons, the one true God of all of of history. Now, secondly, let's talk about this. How does Jesus fulfill the law and the prophets? Or another question in the text is, how should our righteousness surpass the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees? See, Jesus gives us this warning after saying that he is the fulfillment of the law. Then he gives us this warning. He says, therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments, one of the the simplest things from the law, and teaches others to do the same, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them, whoever obeys them and teaches others, will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, and here's the warning, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, what is Jesus telling us? He's telling us that our righteousness needs to be in excess of the Pharisees. Now, we might be tempted to think like, well, the Pharisees were pretty bad people because Jesus is often criticizing them. He is often in conflict with the Pharisees. He's often pointing out their hypocrisy. So we might think that, well, they must not be very good, so I don't really have to shoot for that high of a bar. I'm sure I can exceed the Pharisees. Well, that's a pretty uh, naive view of the Pharisees. The Pharisees were very religious, very devout in their faith. They were very serious about obeying the law and the prophets. And it wasn't just a belief for them. They lived out and took it very seriously. So when Jesus says that our righteousness must surpass that of the Pharisees, that is a very serious warning. So I ask the question, in what way must our righteousness surpass theirs? Well, is this a question of quantity? Do do you and I need to do more righteous things than, let's say, a legalistic Pharisee? So, for instance, if they are keeping, let's say, 100 laws, well, we will keep 150 laws. We're going to do more. If they give 10% of their, uh, if they give 10% of their income to the poor and to the temple, well, we should give 15%. And if they pray three times a day, we should pray five times a day. And if they fast for a couple of days, well, we should fast for more days. And we should just do more quantitatively than what the Pharisees do. Well, as an evangelical, this just doesn't sit right with me. There's something in our belief that says it can't just be about attaining more, doing more. We don't earn our righteousness by working hard and by doing more than other righteous people. And at the same time, I don't want to be too quick to write this off completely. Because I don't think what Jesus is talking about is that we should abandon all efforts at righteousness. I don't think he's telling us to stop trying to live a faithful life. But we do know that we cannot attain a greater righteousness by just doing more. So if it's not a quantitative difference, is it a qualitative difference? Uh, Is it a greater quality of righteousness that we are to attain? So, and, and this is probably where we can fall into even greater traps as evangelicals. Like, I don't pray as much as those legalistic people but my prayers are more genuine. My prayers are more authentic. My prayers have a better quality. And this is a trap that so many of us as evangelicals can fall into. One of the ways I hear this phrased is to pit religion against relationship. And I hear evangelicals use this language. And there's, on one hand, I get this. Because this saying like that that our walk with Christ is more of a relationship than a religion. And, And in some way, I think what they're trying to say is, that we can't have this just cold, dead religion to where it doesn't really affect our lives. Like We need something that is living and active, that engages with a living God. It can't just be this cold, formal religion. And that does seem to be speaking to something important. But the problem is, all relationships require 
effort, in righteousness, in ritual. Like those religious people pray a lot. But my five minutes of prayer are just so authentic. And it would never work in any of our other relationships. So we can't just say to God, like, God, I'm not going to really work that hard in my efforts. I'm not going to put much into this, but I'll be really authentic and genuine. I couldn't, you couldn't get away with this in any other relationship. I, th I think about my wife. If I were to say to her, listen, I don't have much time for you. I, I really don't have much quantity to give to you of myself, but the five minutes that I give you, give you tonight, are going to be of such impeccable quality. It's going, to, it's going to be so great. These just few moments that we spend together, I'm going to put so much authenticity and genuineness into the five minutes that I give you that you're gonna be blown away. Like, that would never work, guys, so d don't try it. You, you can't maintain a healthy relationship just by tiny moments of quality. In fact, I think this, this idea of quality time is, is a false notion. You can't do this with your children. If I were to say to my daughter, Listen, I, I've only got 15 minutes for you this week, but I want it to be a really, really good 15 minutes. So starting right now, tell me all the important things that are on your heart and let's have a really deep conversation, but we need to wrap it up in, in just a quarter of an hour because that's all the time I have. Like, it would never work. I heard a pastor say, like, all quality time happens in the context of quantity time. For there to really be genuineness and authenticity and quality, it requires time and effort and practice. How is our righteousness supposed to surpass that of the Pharisees? Well, I don't think it's necessarily about being more authentic or more genuine or having more quality time with God. I also don't think it's just about doing more. It's not putting more efforts in and just trying to attain greater than them. Well, let's go back and let's look at the first question. I think this will help us understand how our righteousness is to surpass that of the scribes and the Pharisees. How does Jesus fulfill the law? One way we talk about him fulfilling the law is to contrast law and grace. And this is true. There's a definite truth here. When you read the book of Romans, this really comes out. And, and the, the, the narrative goes something like this. We are all sinners. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We are not good in ourselves. And all of our attempts to live out the law have failed. And then the law has really become a burden. So we try to live faithful according to the law, but we can't. And, and then Paul says, wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? And the answer is, thanks be to God, through Christ Jesus our Lord. And then he says, now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we see that, that we, we try to live according to the law, but that we can't attain because of our own sinfulness and our own brokenness. And Christ in his grace comes and redeems us. And this is a very true picture of the gospel. We are redeemed by Christ's grace. This image of the law being a burden that we cannot attain in our own sinfulness, and Christ's grace is the only thing that can set us free, is key to understanding the gospel. But it is not the only lens by which we look at the gospel. And in fact, I don't think that understanding of law versus grace is how we can make sense of the Sermon on the Mount. We need a different lens. And I, I think, let me explain. This passage that we're looking at today is really the key passage that's going to lead for the next five or six weeks as we look at the rest of chapter five. What Jesus does in chapter five is he starts to go through some of the laws and he doesn't let his followers off the hook. He doesn't say, you know, this, is, this law is really hard, so just trust in me and you'll be forgiven because you can't live out the law. That's not what he does. Actually, on a surface level, Jesus actually raises the bar to the law. He says, it's not just about not murdering. I say don't hate. He says, it's not about just adultery. I tell you, do not look at a woman lustfully. So Jesus is saying, you think the bar is here, but actually the bar is higher. So how does Christ fulfill the law? It's not just about forgiving us. Here's the answer. 
the fulfillment of the law in Christ is love. It is God's love for us. It is God's grace and forgiveness for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. And the fulfillment of the law is love, our love for God. Our righteousness is not to be a slavish obedience to a demanding God to try to earn his affections. It is to respond to his love with our love for him and for our neighbor. Of course, in Matthew 22, skip ahead a few chapters, Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. All of the law rests on the love of God and the love of our neighbor. Christ fulfills the law by revealing the love of God for us. While we were broken in our sin, while we were hopeless and lost, Christ died for us. He was perfect. He did not deserve to die. He was God himself, divine and holy, and yet he laid down his life. This is the heart of God, the God of love. And yet our response to this love is to be enraptured with love for him, to respond to his love with our love of God. Because the only kind of holiness that we can ultimately have is love. To live not for ourself, but for God. And if we do that, if we love God and we love our neighbor with our whole heart, we will by nature fulfill the law. But we have to have a right view of love. Our world has a fundamentally flawed view of what love is. I have a confession to make. I know every single word to Whitney Houston's The Greatest Love of All. Whitney Houston was a great singer, uh, but I was never really, you know, into like romantic music from the 1980s. That really wasn't my, my scene. But before I, you know, forfeit my man card, let me explain. Um, you know, she was a great, great singer. Her, her Star Spangled Banner rendition was one of the greatest of all time. But um, here's why I know every word to this song. I was obsessed with basketball when I was a kid. And we had some VHS tapes back in the day of some of the greatest players in the 1980s basketball and and they would they were highlights of some of the greatest players and they were all set to music and so most of the most of the videos like Larry Bird and Magic Johnson and Charles Barkley they they all had this like rocking upbeat music for all of their highlights and we were, I, and I just watched this video over and over again but on this video Michael Jordan's highlights were set to Whitney Houston's The Greatest Love of all, which is like so slow and so sappy. And it just was like so weird to be watching like the greatest basketball player in the history of the world, like to music that you could slow dance to. It just was, but I still watched it and I watched it over and over and over again. I think I wore out that VHS tape. But now, because I've watched it so many times, I could sing to you every word from Whitney Houston's The Greatest Love of All. Line goes this. I decided long ago never to walk in anyone's shadow. If I fail, if I succeed, at least I live what I believe. No matter what they take from me, they can't take away my dignity. Because the greatest love of all is easy to achieve. Learning to love yourself, it is the greatest love of all. Oh man, that's bad. That was flat at the end. Man, you should not ever try to sing Whitney Houston. She's like too amazing, right? But you get the words of this? The greatest love of all is learning to love yourself. And this song is like powerful and emotional, but it is fundamentally flawed. It has the wrong view of love. 
I don't know if I don't know if Whitney Houston wrote this song or not. Clearly, she was a broken person, but but I think her song represents the, the fundamental issues that we have in our cult culture. We, we tend to say in our culture, the, pro the problem is that we care too little for ourselves. But I think it's actually the opposite. I think our biggest problem is that we are obsessed with ourselves. We have a far deeper problem of narcissism in our culture. We think only of ourselves and we say, you know, when he says the greatest love of all is learning to love yourself. And I would say, no, being self-obsessed is actually a huge problem. In fact, there are many people in our culture, and this is a problem, they, they end up harming themselves. They treat themselves poorly, but it's not because they, they don't care about themselves. It's they've looked for happiness within themselves, and they don't find it, and they end up despairing. See, what the scripture tells us is that the greatest love of all is actually when we lay down our life for another. It is the love of Jesus Christ. The love of Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the law because he was God. He was perfect. He was guiltless and he laid himself down for us. How can our righteousness surpass that of the, the Pharisees and the scribes? It is this. It is to love God. It is to take our, our eyes off of ourselves and to fix them on Christ. Not to fix them on our performance of the law. It is to be enraptured with love for Christ, to give ourselves to him. And then as we do this, the law is fulfilled through love. I know this because I understand relationships. Relationships are fulfilled by love, not law. The Bible tells us, the Bible tells us that marriage is actually an image, it is a metaphor for our relationship with God. So marriage is actually, the earthly marriage between a husband and wife is actually a sign, it is a shadow of what it is like to be in relationship with God. Dennis Kinlaw says this, he says, God gives us marriage to teach us that we will find fulfillment, not in ourselves, but we will find fulfillment in giving ourselves to another person. And I know this. I know this with my relationship with Jill. When I first met Jill, I would have said pretty early on that I loved her. But you know what I meant by love? I really would have meant like, I really like being around you. I like the way that I feel when I'm around you. I think you're pretty attractive and I really enjoy you. And so I love you. And so whenever I said I love you to Jill early on in my marriage, I meant something like, it makes me feel good. And this is so much our view of what, what love is in our culture. It's about our own feelings. But as I've grown in marriage, and this gets to what Kinlaw is talking about, as I've grown in marriage, what I've realized is that I find so much more joy in making my wife happy. If she is not happy, I am not happy. <laughs> if, if she is struggling, I am struggling. And, and the greatest joy is not getting something from her, but it's actually giving myself to her. And I actually really enjoy blessing her and fulfilling her. And this is what Kinlaw is talking about. Like the greatest fulfillment you will find is not trying to find it in yourself. It is actually giving yourself away so that you're not even thinking about yourself. I have never in my marriage ever gotten out my marriage license and said to my wife, see, see, look, I am keeping all the terms of our agreement. I am following the letter of the law. It's, it's not necessary because love is, is the fulfillment of the law. I don't have to go back to our, I don't have to go back to our vows and say, look, I'm doing my duty. I'm following the law. No, love fulfills the law. And this is how Christ is the fulfillment of all the law. Do you know the infinite love of Jesus Christ in your life? Have, have you been spinning your wheels and spinning your wheels trying to find fulfillment and meaning? And he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I, I will give you rest. And if you come to him and you're growing in your love for him, 
and you are giving yourself freely to him. Well, this is the way of joy in love and peace. In loving God, we are set free from the slavish bondage of performance, of doing enough, of trying to live out righteousness. But in loving him, his Holy Spirit enters in and we can fulfill the law through our love, through the love of God in us. May you know his love. May you live in his love. And may you give yourself in love back to God and to those around you. God bless you.